Nigeria's Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, on Sunday ordered the immediate ban of the activities of Federal Special Anti-Robbery Squad, FSARS, and other tactical squads of the police force. This includes other criminal elimination squads operating in federal, zonal and command levels. Or well, the ban followed the viral video that surfaced online on Saturday about the alleged shooting of a youth in Ueli Delta State. This action led to Nigerians, celebrities inclusive, taking to social media to protest the many deaths caused by SARS operatives across the country. Uh, to discuss this development and other security issues in the country, we are joined by a security expert, Shei Adetayo, and public affairs analyst and spokesman for the Action Democratic Party, Adela Jadelye. Good morning, gentlemen, and it's good to have you uh, both on Newsday. Good, good afternoon. Morning. Oh, good, good afternoon, afternoon, rather. <laughs> and just good to afternoon. add that we had invited the spokesperson of the Nigeria Police Force, Frank Umba, who had, uh, on the last minute, you know, uh, said he was on his way to Ondo State ahead of the elections and could not make it today. Would have been nice to get the uh, police response to this as well. But it's great to have both of you join us on the show today. Thank you. And, and just to begin, I would like to ask, uh, how is this ban different from previous directives given uh, to the SY Inspector General of Police or the present one on this same matter. Let me begin with you in the studio here, uh, Mr. Shea. Uh, it, it, I would say it's not different uh, because uh, we've seen like um, the last three years about five pronouncements and none seems to have um, actually seen the light of the day. And uh, that speaks volume as to uh, management and uh, internal control in an organization when um, a regimented organization like that is issuing a directive to all director, I mean, deputy inspector general of police, AIGs, commissioner of police, and then um, you don't see it being implemented. Um, that speaks volume. There is something that I want us to, to actually look here. Um, we have other agencies that it appears as if things are working better than that of the Nigerian police. And the question is, what are they doing? Uh, that the Nigerian police is not doing. I'll give an example like the DSA. DSA is an offshoot of the Nigerian police. And most of the internal control mechanisms being used in the DSS are what they inherited, their heritage of the Nigerian police. So it means that if those things are working for the DSS, why is it not working for the police? The offenses against discipline, the NSO regulation, DSS regulations are police regulations. And you see that it, when police give directive, you see, it diminishes as it attenuates to the fringes. When the IG gives instruction, you see implementation at the force headquarters. And as it goes down to the uh, commands, you see that um, it starts diminishing. The same thing at the state level. When the commission of police has given a directive, you see it go to the police uh, force, uh, command headquarters in Lagos. You see discipline. You see police well-dressed. You see the way they will talk to you with all courtesy. And it shows because they are closer to the authority. But as it's added, no, it's too. You know, the area commands, you see, go to area F in the Kedja, and you, you see some form of sanity, but not as much as you see at the first headquarter. But I start moving further to area G, Ogba, to Allah Kukor, they start seeing that like a total deviation from what you see at the first headquarters, which means that the control measures put in place there is a problem with the directorate or a department that is responsible to ensure that all the internal control mechanisms in the Nigerian police are being enforced. There is a disconnect somewhere. Uh, you've raised the question, why is it uh, uh, Shei, uh, sorry, uh, Delaja, he, he's raised the question, why is it working at the head, right? Yeah. And it's not working when you go down the line. Well, you, you probably take that on, but for the fourth four time within four years, the IG, IGPs over the years have banned, uh, you know, uh, the FSARs, as it were. The question then is, where is the disconnect on whose table do we lay the blame? The police high echelon who cannot train its operatives, as it were, well, or the operatives who are overzealous in carrying out their responsibilities? Well, I, I think uh, I would like to lay a foundation as far back as 1992 that um, the 
SARS was created by the former uh, commissioner of police in Lagos, uh, who is uh, Simon Dalladi. What happened uh, that led to, although there were about uh, three different um, uh, anti robbery uh, scored before Dalladi you know, brought out his home, it was like we are, we, are, we are trying to solve a problem that was created by police that led to creation of SARS. A, 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 a police officer in Lagos shot and killed a military officer and information got to the, mil to the military and they deployed soldier. Then the police ran away. So at that time, there were a lot of breakdown in, in, in security architecture of the police in Lagos. So they needed to quickly solve this problem then Danladi came up with what he called Special Anti-Robbery Squad in that 1992. And at the end of the day, you find out that, you know, the problem that uh, we were to solve is now creating another problem for us. And if you go back and begin to see a lot of reports, you know, here and there, you see how it is pointing to SARS that they have outlived their relevance. The purpose for which they were created was to tackle armed robbery, kidnapping, and some other you know, social vices and criminalities in the country. But right now, instead of them to go along with their, you know, the KPIs, they are now facing Nigerians, innocent Nigerians, killing them, investing their soul every day as if that is their main purpose for which they were created. Now, the problem is that, um, just like Mr. Shehi said, when the IGP gives instruction that SARS should be disbanded, you will find out that, you know, uh, another, uh, when it gets to another IGP, you will still give the same instruction. And nobody cares. As at 9 p.m. last night, I still, with my Koro Koro eye, I saw SARS operating in this Lagos, even after the instruction was given much, much later in the afternoon. So to tell me, discipline is not part of, you know, uh, is not part of uh, SARS we have today. If we have discipline, they are going to go strictly based on they are call a call for for, for for their for their assignment. But they have derailed. So there's no discipline anywhere. That's why you see SARS. They do. They, in fact, they become so dreaded that when you see anybody wearing black and anything black. You, you know, you, be, you begin to you begin to find a way to run away. So those there are a lot of people that they have killed, that as a result of panic. Okay, it's not as maybe they are criminal. They are not criminal, but they were killed because of how dreaded you know SARS have become over the year. I mean, you've made you've made points there, but Mr. Shea, let me bring it back to you because he sort of laid the foundation of why we need to form SARS in the first place. But uh, this recent disbanding order. Is it, the right in the, is it a step in the right direction? How did they even go from being anti-robbery squad to being this menace, extermination, extortion squad that we see today? Okay, um, let me start by saying this. Do we have to cancel SACS? The answer is no. You can call it any name. It is still a department that is important in the Nigerian police. Even world over, they have the special weapon and tactical team. That is what they are supposed to be. Now, you see, the, the problem here has to do, is an institution problem. And, okay, you disband us today, the same individual, you are still going to put them in the Nigerian police. Mm. Now, look at what, what is happening. Apart from the conventional SARS, each division has their own anti crime that are dressed like SARS, and they are carrying out the same thing. It's more or less like it's an order within. And if you look at the story, it, we will later get to know that they were not actually SARS. But that tells that we have people like that. And it has to do with number one, discipline, internal control, and then how do you make people to be accountable for their action? As long as we continue to see this as uh, uh, operational misconduct, then this will never end. If somebody carries gun and force you to give him money, mm -hmm. it's not misconduct, it is armed robbery. Let's call it what it is. 
until we start treating those cases as armed robbery. Because the only reason why I will give you money is because of the weapon you are carrying. Yes. And then when you arrest an armed robber, they don't charge them for armed robbery. They also charge them for illegal armed possession. Now, most times, they are supposed to also be charged for illegal arms possession because they carry out those operations when they are not even supposed to be on duty. If a policeman is not on duty, but say carries his weapon to go and form a roadblock or a patrol, at that point, the harm with him is an illegal weapon. Yeah, because the, not to be you're not supposed to carry it. Mm -hmm. So when you, apart from you taking them through your the room trial, your internal, um, say, okay, we are firing you for doing this, charge them to court for harm robbery. Mm -hmm. When police officers begin to face, you know, uh, um, consequence of their actions, it will serve us. You see, we have lots of beautiful police officers, responsible police officers, police officers that you see that we want you want to become a police officer, and then we will not, we should not, as a nation, allow these few bad eggs to me. paint our police system yeah. as a hopeless system. All right, so let me start with you. Uh, we'll, I'll come to you. Uh, 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 Adel Adelaide. Adelaide. Adelaide, yes, yeah. I'll come to you, Adelaide. But let me start with you because you've raised, well, I think you've tackled the, the, the question I wanted to address to uh, the uh, spokesman of the police and that. But of course, you could have answered it about do you throw away the bathwater at the baby? You know. But the ITP says the responsibility of misdemeanors by any operative now lies within the purview of their commanding officers in their areas of responsibility, their AORs. How will this help in reining in the excesses of errant police operatives? He talked about it. He talked about it in discipline. So how will this, because, and he said, even as, at, as early as when the instruction was given, he still saw SARS operatives on the road. And then you were talking about the fact of, you know, making sure that people pay for the consequences of their actions. So how would this directive by the IDG, um, IGP help in <clears> curbing <throat> the excesses, if you like, of errant police operatives? Let me shock you. Weapons have been recovered from armed robbers. If you carry out an effective auditing in all the commands today, we will not be able to account for those weapons in the Nigerian police. Harmonitions are not being able to. You see, I, I, I retire from the DSS. For every round you fire, you will write a report explaining why you fired the weapon, giving justification for one round. And then they do a periodic um, auditing where you come with your firearm and the rounds. Is it uh, yeah, it's still happening now. They will check it. And DSS has, they have where they purchase their own rounds. Their bullets are different. So you cannot just go and bring bullets. So what people do is that they talk to their police friends and buy bullets from them. I'm trying to show you the rots in the system. They buy bullets from them and they use the bullets. Because for every bullet you fire as a DSS officer, you must account for it. And that's why you see those that are doing protective security, those that are following, you know, businessmen around. You see them inside traffic, they start firing weapons, they go to public function, they start. Those were not the rounds that were given to them by the service, by the Nigerian police, or whichever agencies they are working with. So it has to start from how we control the rounds available within the force. What are the activities of the Amoras? Because all those rounds, this same control in the DSS also, they are offshoot of what they took from the Nigerian police. I don't know if you, you understand what I'm trying to say now. Uh, yeah. So those small, small things are key, are important. That if control starts with the weapon that is in your hand, the round, if we are giving you 30 rounds and every week you have to account for it, you will not stay on the road and shoot people. If you shoot people, by the time you come back and there are four rounds missing, you need to account for why you fire those rounds and justify it. If you lose one and you cannot, it is dismissal. 
You still have not tackled the question I asked you before we go to... Okay. Because I'm talking about uh, the IGP giving instruction to, to, to the commanding um, uh, officers, officers uh, in their areas of responsibility to take responsibility and be accountable, uh, accountable for errant operatives in their areas of responsibilities. Most times, the commanding officers are the one giving them targets. We've seen it happen. I saw people yesterday, I also saw yesterday, Sunday. I saw, but these ones are from the local government, I mean, sorry, from the divisions. They were out there wearing the black SAS, but I know that they are not FSAS. They're not the normal SAS. And um, the DPO cannot claim that he's not aware that his men are out, despite the fact that he is aware he has listened to the, the vice president speak an IG, and he still did not call the member to say, go and change your uniform and wear a uniform that shows your name. Hmm. So it, it starts with, and if, you see, you will see the Lagos command has been doing lots of, I mean, so much by discipline, officers, errant officers. But I look forward to seeing them taking it further to say, the person you are reporting to, what is the person's involvement in your indiscipline acts? Because we don't hold them accountable. And that's the reason why they continue to push these boys outside. Let, let me shock you again. From the agencies where we just were retired, if anyone reporting to you misbehave, both of you are going for it. This lack of supervision, sure. lack of management. And I hear complicity in what you have said, you know, yeah, that even the, the, uh, all the way to the hierarchy, they do know about what is happening. But let me bring it to you, Mr. Adelaja. He's talked about accountability. There's also the issue of justice and feedback. Um, how much of a role does recruitment of this personnel and their welfare play in all of this? Um, how are they recruited? Should we take a second look at that? And does the welfare, you know, play a role in what we're seeing playing out from being anti robbery squad to now becoming, uh, you know, extortion squad from Nigerians? And robbers. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> you have just called them the name they, they, they deserve. You see, the truth of the matter is that um, we cannot afford to throw a baby with the bath water, you know, um, disbanding uh, SARS almost every time any new G uh, IGP comes in, in, into office is not the solution. We have to look at the internal mechanism of the police itself. Because, for instance, I remember years back that I used to work in the bank. If you maybe uh, a, a junior staff you commit any offense, they will find a way to rope your immediate boss into heat because that shows that neg negligence on, on his or her part. Okay, so you, 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 both of you will, have, will be punished for, for that. If the Inspector General of Police is aware that Mr. President will take action that may lead to his sacking from the office, okay, I'm telling you, he will find a way to bring out mechanism that will trickle down to the last person in the police. But because we're in a country whereby, you know, it's party party government, you understand? So anybody does whatever they like, so they feel, no, they cannot be sacked, nothing can happen to them at the IGP level, at the other lower cadre level. They, they, nobody is taking responsibility for anything, so nobody cares, you understand? If you see what happened yesterday, Vice President came out and other leaders in the country came out to express their frustration at what uh, I, uh, SARS are doing. You see someone in the presidency, someone like uh, uh, Loretta Onache, is, is, is trying to water down what everybody is clamoring for. That's to show to you how on seriousness we have you know, in, in, in leadership of the country, where everybody is speaking how their people are being killed, how people are being extorted, how their people are being, you know, tortured, and all, all sorts of things that we are seeing evidence everywhere. But you will still see someone in the presidency making joke out of that. That's to show to you the kind of country we have. So until when people now begin to take responsibility, people now begin to, you know, do the right thing, people now begin to take instruction the way it should be, until then, we are just you know, deceiving ourselves. Another IGP will come, 
and he will tell you again that uh, he's disbanding SARS and the problem will go on and off, on and off, on and off like that. But what we need to do... I, I, I don't really know what you mean by seriousness in the... Uh at uh, the level of leadership, because the president, the vi you just said that the vice president has spoken about it. Uh, the president also, I'll ask you this question now, I'm just trying to, uh, um, you know, reference what he said, because uh, uh, I, I want to ask you what has become of the president's uh, directive to the IGP, Ministry of Justice, uh, and the uh, National Human Rights Commission to work out modalities for the implementation of the report of the presidential panel on the reform of SARS within three months. Was it that on arrival or was it just abandoned? <clears throat> because that, that's from the highest quarters of the I, land. I, I, I may not be able to, for maybe, may, maybe if, if I'd had the a benefit of, I mean, um, information, probably I could have tried to uh, place one or two calls well, to me, know. But she, she asked one question that okay. um, he actually didn't touch. Yeah. And that, that, that's about the welfare. Yes, the welfare and recruitment. I, I was part of the committee, technical committee for Lagos State um, Security Summit, where we worked on, uh, tried to develop a 25 years plan for security for Lagos State. And I remember when we were having our technical session, um, the committee, and I remember I raised the issue of mental health. Mental health is a major factor in law yeah. enforcement. Yes. You see, we are having what we have today. We are the cause as a nation. And it's high time that the society begin to take responsibility for what he has, you know, turned the police to become. The abuse in the police, we are the cause. We, get, we made police what they had today. And I, I'm bringing it back to mental health because it's part of welfare. Mm -hmm. The issue here is not about money. You see, there is a line of life and death, line of do not kill. The moment you shoot somebody or you kill somebody, the line has been crossed. In America, in other advanced countries, they make you to see a psychologist instantly to counsel you because you may end up to become a monster. And that is what we've seen. If they are forced killing, or shoot it, whether it is legitimate or not, during, um, you know, responding to robbery and the fire is shot. They're supposed to be made to see a psychologist that will help them to go through what was going through their mind as at the time they were shooting. Was there hesitation? Did you do fire without even thinking? All these things are important mm -hmm. because you end up building a generations of monsters within the force, and that's what we're seeing today. You know, I, this I, guy I, can I, kill without I, blinking. Yeah, I have it here, Adelaide, that what are the force has taken the pains, really, to evaluate the immediate medical and psychological mean of these operatives uh, and how that affects their relationship with the citizens they are supposed to protect because we just accuse the police, we just... I, I, I mean, I, had a, I, had, I read a story, you know, of somebody who was you know, driving, and then police stops him, and then they were searching him. The other one, he came down from the car, spoke to, just like he was saying, this guy spoke to him gently, in a gentle manner, and afterwards he said, okay, go back to your car. Then the other one, one other one just said, who told you to go into the car? He said, your colleague told me to go to, is, is, he, is he me? And then eventually, to cut a long story short, the one that told him to go into the car said, that's how he is but we just tolerate him because he's good and armed robbers fear him. So that's why I'm asking this question, Adelaja. The question of taking into cognizance, you know, medical and psychological men of these police operatives in, their, in how they relate with you and I on the streets. Well, I think um, recruitment process is a key factor in every organization. If you, go, if you see banks, Sometimes they outsource some of these to um, companies that can scrutinize candidates before they place them on employment. But in the case of police, I believe it's just uh, thrown open to the public in a way that um, some, in fact, some people, some, they even try to politicize it in, so, in such a way that people just come with all sorts of slots and all sorts of slots and just push people into the police. And when these people who are not prepared mentally, psychologically, they get into police, they now begin to misbehave. 
Also, you have to look at um, what they do at the police training college. What sort of what sort of training do they have there? What is the cur curriculum they are using? Is it uh, con in conformity with um, international standard and all, all all that? So those are things that we have to look at. And again, you have to look at uh, the the general belief of people. You now see these days that people go into police because they feel it's an avenue for them to make money because they believe that with the gun in their hand, they can, they can within a period of one year, they, 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 make, they, they make money. So these are things that uh, we need to consider. And it is just uh, what uh, the, the, the police service commission or the, the agency in charge of recruitment of police needs to look at and see how they can begin to you know, attract you know, best you know, uh, candidates into police force. So, you know, some, someone was uh, joking the other day that um, we, we need to find a way to get people uh, who are graduates into police because uh, their education, in a way, could help them reshape the way they think and the way they conduct themselves in the public. I believe this is not uh, impossible if we, 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 we use a multi-dimensional approach in recruiting people. You recruit people who are educated, people who are well, you know, uh, you know, trained from home. You know, these are these are factors we can also we, we can consider when we are carrying out these uh, recruitment processes. And also, they need to go through. A, a, um, a psycholo a psychologist needs to find a way to deal with them at the point of um, uh, recruitment because they need from there they will be able to know those who are um, they have anger uh, problem then they can send them to anger management classes so that uh, they, can, they, can, they, can, they, can, they can become better before they are pushed into, into, the, into the police. Because average police officer you meet on the road, you see them, they behave so erratic, they become so aggressive, not even, by not even asking you questions, you have not even you know, answered them, you see all, all sort of uh, trying, to, you know, trying to intimidate you, just talking to you. That you have not, you have not been found, you know, wanting that you have committed any crime or whatever. So, so these are things that I need. I think we need to consider. All right, Mr. Shea, you wanted to react to that? Yeah, I think it's 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 um a process. It's, it's an entire process. It's, it's not limited to recruitment. Mm. Now, let me share my experience with you. When I was being um, enlisted and commissioned in the DSS, um, after the normal examination mm -hmm. and. Those of us that were selected were made to go through psych psychiatric evaluation. So it does exist? Yes. They go through psychological in the evaluation? DSS, yes. In Abekut, I went to neuropsychiatric hospital. Okay. We were all, we went there, they did the evaluation for us. And those of us that um, scaled through were recruit recruited there. Uh, I don't know whether this um, is still continuing to do it. Uh, I've, I've not been part of recent recruitment, but I, I can only speak for when I came on board. But it doesn't stop at that. Your training program, you see, we, we came into the training with a mindset. We left there with a different mindset. The training is supposed to mold you to become what the nation wants you to do. Now, after the training uh, institution have been able to do that, they now throw you into the commands, into the structure. They are supposed to put a process in place to manage you going forward. Left to me, if the current IG wants to make uh, a mark, a difference in Nigeria today, you should make case to start recruiting psychologists. More than enough psychologists in all the commands. At every point in time, these people need to, after their uh, commanding officer needs to be able to say, okay, you need to. When somebody go for an operation and he had an arm robbery, uh, arm robbery encounter, even if he didn't shoot, but he was exposed to a stressful uh, environment, mm -hmm. he's supposed to be able to, you know, see, and uh, they evaluate him and be able to say, okay, you need a rise and try to take him through in the process of recovery, you know, from the shock that, and if somebody had already killed someone, you see where a SARS officer will kill a number of and take a picture with it. Mm. We're having people that are having psychopathological issues. Because that shouldn't happen. In the Nigerian police, as it is. And who is to be blamed? We, the society. Because we are not giving the best to our Nigerian police. We are not, you see, as much as we are calling for, to end SARS right now, we should also be calling for the right into way. There's nothing like ending of SARS. You can change your name, you can change the way, and I love what the, you know, it's, it's a process. And what the, the decision it took now, you know, the previous IG will have said uh, disbandment. He said, no. Oh. Yeah. 
I am putting control on how you work. Now, it gave directive to their superiors on, for implementation. But what he now needs to do now is now put mechanism in place. First of all, there is a Psychological Society of Nigeria, so I don't know what, 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 what they call it. Meet with them. Get, sign a kind of MOU with them where they can start doing a kind of um, support for the Nigerian police, where Nigerian police is trying to recruit psychologists into Nigerian police, and start providing you know, support, telling all their members across the whole country to start partnering with each divisions, making themselves available, and making the DPOs hold uh, meetings, you know, um, sessions with them for them to understand these are activities or signs, the things you see that will tell you that this person needs to actually have a conversation. At times, you see, um, they, 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 there's a man called Sigmund Freud yeah. that talks about uh, psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And um, you see, if, if you look at psychoanalytical theory, it talks about, you know, that most of the things we do are from the subconscious. You know, like when somebody uh, stutter or you could call it food of sleep, mm -hmm. it says that it's not a mistake. It's something that is from your subconscious that you, you brought out. And that brings me to my next question very quickly because we are almost out of time. Um, you know, the agitation has been so rife that at the last killing, it not, you know, morphed from NSAS to kill SARS. So the people are agitated. From your point of view, from your, you know, um, from your thought, what do you think the Nigerians should do at this point? Because we also have a role to play. How do we communicate and address, you know, men of the police and even this squad as we see them? Because there are several reports that they are still on the road, despite this instruction from the hierarchy of the police command or the federal government. They are still there, stopping and searching. How do you communicate with them? What should it be? So there is a perception issue now. Mm -hmm. When people see SARS, they are afraid. So it's a perception issue. From the Nigerian police, I think they need to change the name, they need to rebrand it, so that when people see a new structure, it communicates something. Now, that, I'm basically uh, saying how I'm, do I'm, relate I'm, to them. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm going there. Mm -hmm. So, because relating to them right now is still going to be that of fear. Yes. But for that fear to be removed, I expect the IGP right now trying to look for a name. You can call them SWAT. Well, what has the name got? They talk <laughs> no, no, about turning into ARS, uh, you know, anti-robbery squad instead of SWAT. It is, it is important. It is important. Psychologists will tell you that this is important. Okay. You need to com communicate something to the people to also show that, yes, this process of changing what SARS is. All right, Jay, Jay, we're going to have to leave it there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So many issues to raise. Yeah. Uh, but thank you so much. Yeah, the entire security analyst, and Adela Jada, a public affairs analyst. Th thanks to both of you for being here. Of course, I didn't raise the issue of uh, what, has, uh, what, what correlation has remuneration got to do with all this. Uh, thank you once again. Mm -hmm.